he, he called me over uh, uh, during the party and sat me down and said, look, what would it take to get you to leave Oregon and come back here? And I said, uh, I was never really thinking about that. I didn't know this was a job interview. Uh, um, I, I don't want to leave Oregon. You know, he said, well, you have an opportunity here because I want to start a program, and I think you're the right person for it. And we have a couple of people on the staff here who have told me that you're the right guy. We've been looking for this. If we start this program, it'll be the first program of its kind anywhere, and I'd like you to put your imprint on it. And I won't give you a contract that says you have to stay forever, but I want you to at least kickstart this with us. That sounded really good to me. And I said, well, I think we're going to need a big space. We're going to need some technology. This is going to need a budget. And I didn't know anything about independent schools, and I also didn't know about guys like Richard Purse, who even if he didn't have the money, was you know he waved his hands and said, oh yeah, whatever you want, I'll build a building, I'll pay you whatever you want, whatever. But that's what he did. He said, I'll build a building, we'll wire the school. We didn't even know what wire the school meant yet, but he said, I'll wire the school. He didn't know what he was getting into, but he threw a lot of big words around and big money around and said, yeah, yeah, we'll meet whatever salary you want, whatever. And you know. I didn't know. I, you know, I was working adjunct at the University of Oregon. What did I know about a salary to live in Connecticut, right? And Eugene, you could live on a dollar a year in those days. So um, I thought this was great. So I, um, I, I said, I'm going to do this conservatively. I'm going to go back to Eugene, and I'm going to see if I can take a leave of absence from my job there so I got something to come back to in case this is a disaster. And he said, that's fine. Just let me know soon because um, we want this to get going. I knew I was going to do this. It was, I think that was the only time I ever bluffed in my life. I'm not a very good bluffer. Um, and so I, um, I didn't, I actually, I don't believe I ever took the leave of absence. I just quit. Mm -hmm. And uh, although I wanted to tell them that, thinking maybe that would get me a higher salary or whatever, but it, it, didn't, it didn't matter. I knew this was going to be a great thing for me to do. So I went back there and I ended up working with a woman named Lori Feiss, who was a PhD linguist and the head of their language training program. And Lori um, and I put, put the program together. As a matter of fact, probably when you came there, and I believe you came there before I came to you, it's possible. And a lot of people, once we got on the map, and it only took about three or four months for us to get on the map, people from the state started coming in, people from New York started coming up, and they wanted to see what we were doing so they could either replicate it or, or document it or send postdocs to us or whatever, because we, knew that we needed to, the one thing we knew that was very important that I believe to this day, I don't think it's done to this day enough, we knew we had to rewrite the entire curriculum, at least of the language component of this school. Okay, and the great thing is we had the head of the school in our pocket. He was willing to let us do that. Actually, the head of the curriculum committee at the time was less inclined to do that, but, uh, and the head of the English department thought it was a disaster, but we won him over, he became a huge zealot and Mac guy, uh, but um, it was just not quite there yet. And um, the deal involved um, Robin Fryer and Alan Brightman throwing some money and computers at this school. Um, it involved me documenting the whole thing with a newsletter, if you remember. I think it was called the Macintosh Lab Monitor, where we posted all of our research and, and Lori, the, the linguist, we had a perfect population because no one had used computers before, so we pre-tested all these kids, and then we post-tested them, and we did all these uh, tests of adolescent language, blah, blah, blah. She did a whole bunch of stuff like that. This is, you can't find a control group. You can't find anything like this now, but it was a good opportunity, and Lori uh, knew about it, and so we did a whole bunch of stuff like that. And I felt, after two years, I was done, but I, during that two years, it, I feel like we established that not only just anecdotally, but through data that this connection was real and enough places had replicated it quickly um, and um, now it was time for me to go. Uh, um, Foreman was off and running. Lori was actually leaving and she was, after I met her, we worked so closely together, she became one of my best friends and, and um, um, she was going to Japan to do some research, and you know I didn't want to stick around there anymore. So, so I decided to leave, but not before. And there's the segue into the next piece. She and I presented once together at closing the gap. 
our research findings. We had come up with these research findings after year one, and in year, in whatever, closing gaps in October. So that October, we shared our research findings from year one at Closing the Gap, and that was my first experience there. I should also say that during that first year, I came to you, I think I came to you before Closing the Gap at Consense, or at whatever it was called mm -hmm. back then, and met, maybe it was in the second year, but during one of those two years before I left Foreman, I met the people at CAST and the people in Connecticut that you had, Flo Tabor Brown mm -hmm. and I don't remember all their names, right. but R.J. Cooper and all of those people. I, I wasn't aware of the larger disabilities community. I was not that interested mm -hmm. in it. Uh, um, Closing the Gap was, a pl I may have even heard about Closing the Gap from you, mm -hmm. but um, I doubt I met David Clark yet. I think that came later, but I think I was still at Foreman or I was, it was my second year when I came and taught that summer course at UConn mm -hmm. and I met David Clark. Mm -hmm. But I went to Closing the Gap with Lori in that second year at Foreman and we presented, and I believe that our presentation, I don't have a great memory of it, but I'm pretty sure it was well attended. It was on the Macintosh. It was the first mention of Macintosh probably at Closing the Gap. And because of this, Alan Brightman was very happy about this. And I remember very, very, this I remember absolutely. Alan Brightman met me for the first time, I'd never met him before, in the, in the trade show. Apple had a big booth back then. And I was giving out copies of our Macintosh lab monitor, which was a nicely printed uh, uh, piece done by a guy around, right around here, actually. Uh, that I shipped out there, and um, he was just, he was just, uh, uh, between the data that we had, which he uh, ended up using, this piece, he said, what can I do for you? I said, well, I, I'm probably leaving this place, and he just, uh, this guy is like, he, uh, his visionary capabilities were, were in full swing then, and he said, look, um, I'm going to have Jane Lee, a person who works with me, get in touch with you, and we're going to talk about some consulting at Apple because I've, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that there's a lot we can do together. And um, that, so I left Foreman knowing that I was going to do this kind of thing on a larger scale. It, I hadn't really embraced, even though I went to Closing the Gap and Laurie and I walked around, I hadn't really embraced this other larger assistive technology world. I was still trying to do my thing, which was just this more narrow uh, uh, um, a world of learning disabilities and, and very simple technology. Nothing, in those days, there was nothing specialized for anything. The, the most specialized thing was the possibility of possibly getting your computer to talk. Although Macintosh in those days was pretty crude. Still useful, but uh, pretty crude. And I should say at this point, I never used any of those assistive technologies personally. I wrote and did all the things that everybody else does with their computer. Never really felt the need for that. By this point in my life, I was already over the hump that a lot of people go through a lot earlier in their lives. So, um, I don't remember exactly what happened in that second year, but I got exposed to the beginnings of, now what was this called? It's, n it's now called the Alliance for Technology Access, but it had another name before mm -hmm. that. Whatever that name was, uh, Alan said, Jackie Brand and I are starting this thing up, I believe, and I may have this history wrong, but um, and we're going to need training on the Mac in a lot of these different places, and I would like you to do that. So that was my first deal with Apple, and through that, um, I started traveling around to, to these different places. And I have to say that the person who facilitated that the most was not Alan. Alan is the guy that says it, but someone else actually does it. <laughs> and the one who did it was Jane Lee. Jane Lee uh, was my mother at Apple. I mean. Uh, uh, um, she taught me how to deal with Apple, how to write an invoice, how to be a consultant, how to travel easily. She was a very important resource for me.